we'll do whatever possible. So, so Keith sent them, or they, they sent Keith, he visited the woman in Georgetown and got a signed statement of a uh, power of attorney and statement of the lineage. And he got another one from the lady in, in uh, New Jersey. <clears throat> Those documents were placed in a summons that John Lee of the state archaeologist verified and were given to the magistrate, the closest magistrate in Berkeley County, and sent to the property owner in Chicago. I'm pleased to announce that a month ago, this gentleman said, I yield <laughs> to the law of the state of South Carolina. You have my permission to clean up the, uh, the grave and the monument of Hezekiah Mayo, and I must admit that I did not know that the monument or the graveyard was there, or who, quote, in hell was Hezekiah Mayo. <laughs> So I'll, I'll end this little talk saying that as soon as it cools off and the mosquitoes and the alligators go away, we're going to have, we're going to organize, Keith and I, an expedition to Mayhem's grave, which will require um, uh, axes and four by fours to go into, <laughs> and muscle, uh, to go into the swamp and to clear the monument. So I, I'd like to state here today that Hezekiah Mann was indeed an American hero. He was a hero of the American Revolution. <coughs> he was a friend and neighbor of Francis Marion, and we should honor his grave and his memorial. Thank you.
to these people. Uh, but there are two here today, and, and they are sitting on the front porch of the general's house. And the general, of course, is not there. He may be in heaven, he may not be. <laughs> Christine Swagger, you have already met, those of you who have been here all day today. Uh, she's the author of the several books that are on the tables on the outside. She's available to sign those books if you'd like to buy one, and you can do that right after the program. She's a visitor, and she's come to see Mrs. General Marion. As I said, they are on the porch. Let us listen in. There's no tape recording. You either hear it now or you don't hear it. <laughs> <laughs> Turn that off. No. Oh, that was the oh. an emergency broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> interfering with the speaker. Exciting. He has a very strong looking face. 
very weather, and you know he's seen a lot. Sort of old, well, he's not very tall, but he's not, he's lean and, and, uh, and fit, I'm and sure. fit like, yeah. like a woodsman. And I find that very exciting, although that's not the style. Yeah. The style is more like Billy Washington, you know. Yeah. A, little round. a little round. Yes. <laughs> now, I know you didn't marry until after the war, and I know, of course, your cousins, but did you know him all the time? Oh, well, yes. You know, my mother, she was uh, uh, Annie Cords, uh, Dr. Cords is one of his children. And uh, the general's mother was uh, my Aunt Esther. They were sisters, Annie and Esther. And when uh, Mama was, was young, and she married a Mr. Frank Simmons and had a number of children by him, and he died, he died young. And uh, Gabriel Marion, the, the general's father, who became the guardian of, of Mama's children by her first husband. So they were over the house all the time. And Tom Hester was always coming over, and of course, Frank and, and, and his younger brother, Joe, would also come over, so we would have nice visits, and uh, we were all good friends. And all the time I was growing up, well, Uncle Gabriel lived uh, near where we did, uh, down at Goose Creek, but uh, well, I'd say I was about five or six, and he decided to move his family to Georgetown, so I didn't see them very much for a while. But then, uh, when Joe, Francis's older brother, got married, there was a big wedding at Strawberry Chapel, and it's very pretty down there. Have you been there? No. Oh, you must go. You must go. And they were all dressed up. Everybody was so nice. And there was uh, the general, and he was all dressed up. And he looked so, just so perfect, you know? And uh, after, after the wedding, he asked me to dance. And he was five years older than I was. So it was very exciting for me. I was about 16 and he was 21. And it all looked, oh, you know how it is with young girls. And I was just so taken with him uh, at that time. Because he just, <coughs> so perfect, you know. And such a gentleman. And so kind and considerate. And I've always looked at him on my cousin Frank as, as being uh, the person to go to when I had a problem. And, uh, just, just a very nice gentleman. But I don't think Papa approved of him. Because all the old ladies would say, well, you know, Esther, you know, Mary, you, you can do better. And I never thought I could. But uh, they said, well, you know, he's not a big man. And he's not going to be able to physically take care of you. And he's not long for this world. You know? And that was the funny thing about it. Everybody was saying, he's not long for this world. And yet, here we are, he's outlived them all. And uh, as I went through life, I kept comparing all the different men I met with Cousin Frank. But uh, they all came up short. They didn't measure up. <laughs> That's not a good word either. <laughs> you know, it's not what you look like on the outside that counts. It's how you are on the inside. And on the inside, my cousin Fred, the general, is a very big man, a very great man. And you're never going to find anyone in this match. Well, I've heard a lot about him during the war. Of course, we all heard about his education and his bravery. The one thing that always interested me was when he took Colonel Ball's horse and made the horse about the ball. Uh, and I know that you're a fine rider. Yes. Did you ever get to ride at all? Well, that's an interesting story. Uh, he regrets having named that horse that way. Uh, it was a big joke, you know, at, at the time of his men. Now, we're just the two ladies. Too. This is not a mixed company joke. Okay. Well, you know, Ball was named, the horse was named after John Cummings Ball. And what you don't know, maybe, is that Cousin Frank, General, 
was related by marriage to Horace. Yes. And so there was a little bit more there going on than you think. John Cummings had been boasting all over the county, in fact, all over the state, what he was going to do when he captured Francis Mary. Well, of course, <laughs> it didn't work out that way. The general totally defeated Major Hall and uh, wiped out his unit, and he took that horse. Now, here's the thing. Ball was a gelding. <laughs> <laughs> so he named the horse Ball after John Cummings' Ball. He was saying something to his men. <laughs> and they all thought that was a great joke. But whenever he goes to a party and some lady asks him about his horse, with a very straight space, he just says he named him after John Cummings' ball, but he always turns a little red under under his mm -hmm. tan because of the way the horse is named. Um, but you won't tell anybody. You won't point oh, out. I, I just, he has a very dry sense of humor, <laughs> and some people don't know he's making a joke. He likes to wear this very somber appearance, and that intimidates people. But he really is a sweetheart. And as to riding ball, I have a very nice horse built that my brother left me. And generally, when the general and I go riding, I ride Bill, and he rides ball. So I've heard that he didn't drink. Chair. She said, I didn't have the heart to wake him up. 
Well, he was there for only a short time, and she heard another bang, 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 bang on the door. And this time, the person at the door said, this is Colonel Tarleton of the American Royal Legion. Let me in. Well, her heart was up here, and, and the general woke up with such a start, he ripped the arm right off that chair. And like many of the older houses, Hampton has an escape. A little trap door, you know. And uh, Harriet was very calm about it. She took the general over, showed him the door. He went down the trap door, out through the tunnel, <coughs> out to the river, and swam the river and got away. And in the meantime, Harriet just took her time, walked back, I'm coming, I'm coming. She finally got to the door, and she opened it up, and she was very gracious buying the general time to get away, invited Tom in, said, oh, please search my house. Knowing full well, the general was already out to the river. Sat Tom down, said, here, have a nice meal. So Colonel Tom had Frank's meal, but Frank got away, and that was what was important. I didn't think he could swim, or did he have his horse ready? He can swim, but not very well. He's not a strong swimmer, but I guess fear is a great motivator <laughs> to get across that river in any event. There was another time when he was down by uh, Papa's old, old house down on the lower French Sensi near Vidal's Bridge. And uh, he was all alone. I don't say why he was there. But uh, he started to go and he was on the road and he read, read headlong into a Tory patrol. And uh, because he was all by himself, and the only thing he could do to get away was to jump the fence into the cornfield. Well, that Tory patrol jumped right after him. And now he was in, he was in trouble because that cornfield had been a swamp at one time. And to drain the swamp, we'd cut a ditch at the bottom of that field. The ditch was four feet deep and four feet wide. And we'd taken the dirt and piled it on the inside. And then we put a three foot fence on top of that. And that whole thing was seven feet tall. And Frank was just running across that field on ball. And those Tories were after him. They were on three sides of him. And they were so sure they had him. I could hear them swearing from the house. Surrender or we'll cut you down? Well, of course, they would cut him down if he did surrender. Poor, poor Colonel Cole, who was, was murdered brutally after he surrendered. So they, they would not have given him the order. But the general was not one to surrender. But we all, every, there was no way he was going to get over that fence. That's why they were so certain they had him. But he, put the spurs to ball, and that horse just was beautiful in motion, just stretched out, you can see the muscles rippling in that horse's body, and he lunged forward, and he just watched him stretch out, and he took that, he took that fence, I still don't believe what I saw, he took that fence like he had wings, and he got, recovered himself perfectly on the other side, and the general pulled him up, turned him around, pulled out his pistol, bang, bang, and didn't get anything. But the Tories were so amazed, one, by the fact he took the fence, and two, by the fact he shot at them. They pulled up short. They never got over the fence. And they sat there and looked at each other for two or three seconds. And then the general took his hat, he tipped it, he said, good afternoon, and he trotted off into the, into the woods. Those Tories, they didn't leave. They came back to the plantation house. They got a measuring stick and went went down and measured the fence. They couldn't believe it was seven feet tall. And they had never seen a horse jump like that. And I think that's the, the what the general would say was his closest call. But there was one other that I think was his closest call. And something very few people know about. And that is after the battle of Utah Springs, they, they were fighting in the old country. And it was hot. It was still summer. And the fever started to hit everybody. Everybody in the army was sick. Frank got very sick. So sick that he was in debt. And it was a big secret in the army because they were afraid that if uh, 
British found out they were spared no effort to kill him because he was totally helpless. The only people who really knew about it was Colonel James, his son William, uh, of course General Green, the doctor, and the light robot. But we, we nursed him back to health. I was very, very afraid because that's the way all of Frank's brothers stuff. You know, when the war began, he had Isaac, Gabriel, Benjamin, and Joe. And when the war ended, they had all passed on. And all the disease, just, just sickness, just like Frank was sick. Fortunately, he got better, he got stronger, and they never discovered how sick he had been. Perhaps the failure in the water was a hell. I think it was. I think it was. Now, I told that you go camping. Yes. <laughs> That's, you know, the, the general loves to go fishing, and he loves to go hunting, and he loves to go back and uh, visit the places where all his friends are. And he has all sorts of friends. Some people who are very important, like Governor Moultrie, and then he knows a lot of people who are just very common people who served uh, with him in his brigade, and he, he likes to, to visit with them. And when we got married, he asked me, he said, Mary Esther, what would you like to do for a honeymoon? Do you want to go to New York or Philadelphia or London or someplace? And I said, Frank, what I'd like to do most is I'd like to go to the battle that you saw during the war and meet your friends. So we started touring around the state. And what a good time we had. We took his old tent from the military days and the pots and pans and his two mules and Buddy came with us and we, we went off traveling around the state. Well, as I said, the other thing Frank likes to do is fish. And we also went fishing. And I was never, <laughs> I was bored of fighting. We went in the canoe. Frank was in the back, Buddy was in the front, I was in the center. And we each had our fishing pole. And we were down off, it was, it was wide with swamp, not too far off from the highway, but they knew this fishing pole, and they said they had catfish, really big catfish. So we <coughs> got our fishing rods out, and we were there fishing away. And uh, I think it was. Buddy cooked one, it was a big one. We started to and it had to be this big. And of course we all looked to see the fish, and we looked to see the fish, and the next thing we knew, the canoe went over, and the three of us in the water, and it was very undignified for me, my skirt up over my head. I'm so embarrassed. And Buddy's holding on this big old catfish, and it's pulling him under the water, and he's saying, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it. And the general's saying, let it go, let it go, because he's afraid Buddy's going to drown. He's not a good swimmer. So he's got this fish, and he's flopping around with it, and he starts to walk towards us, and he must have stepped in a hole, because the first thing I know, he's out of sight. Buddy's gone down out of sight, and after a while, he pops back up, surprised look on his face. He still has that silly fish. So we finally get the fish. It's going to be this big, catfish, you know? <laughs> and while we're flopping around in the water, moss, muck, and everything, I hear this voice that says, do you need any help, General? And the three of us stood up like three children with our fingers caught in the cookie jar. And there was the coach to Charlestown, and the driver on the bench, looking down, and all the fine people in the coach, and what they must have thought. Here's mud wet, so embarrassed. So Frank, the, you can't, you cannot ruffle the general. He said, it was as we were on the program, no bill, we're doing fine. And the coachman said, I don't think so, sir. <laughs> Frank said, well, maybe we could use some help getting the canoe out of the water. So the coachman got down, they got the canoe up, and Frank had a few words with him, gave him a few points, and the man started to get back on the coach. I said, Oh, Frank, I can't imagine what people in Charleston are saying. The man knows you. All those people have heard him call him general. I don't know what on earth. I don't know what on earth people are going to say. And Frank said, don't worry about it. They don't know who you are. 
who I am. He said, Frank, he calls you general. He's going to know who you are. Don't worry about it. So as the coachman got up to go away, the general says to him, Bill, thanks for your help. Big grin by the coach. Says, That's all right, General Sumter, anytime. <laughs> So he saved my dignity. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would imagine that you had a wonderfully adventurous life right here in Saipan. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Oh, scary times during the war. Because, as I said, I've known Frank my whole life. And we corresponded for years. And uh, all during the war, he would, at first he wrote, he always called me cuz. I called him cousin back. I had a brother friend, and so I would call him cousin friend. So we did mixed up. And when things got hot and heavy during the war, I had a very faithful servant who would go with verbal messages, and the general would do the same thing. He would, he would send Buddy or something who was very reliable, and always kept me informed of where he was and what was going on, and then I would tell other people because we didn't know what was going on. We didn't know at all. The British papers, at first, they published one or two of his raids in the Charlestown Royal Gazette, and then they totally ignored him, as if he didn't even exist. Uh, when he captured Fort Mott, Fort Watson, they published a, an article that said uh, to the commander, I forget the lieutenant, whatever his name was, uh, it wasn't your fault. But they didn't say what wasn't their fault. So you'd never know that, uh, that the general had been doing anything. The one exception to that is when the British first came into the state, you know, they published those uh, proclamations, you have to come and be a British subject, go fight, or else you know, we'll hang you and burn your, your house and whatever. Well, people were intimidated by that. As I said, Frank had a strange sense of humor. He published a broadside that said he was Colonel Marion of the militia, but well, at that time he wasn't. And he made up a fictitious militia company. And he put this all around just as if he were General Cornwallis putting out a broadside offering pardon to people who came back to the Patriot cause. Well, of course, he intended it as a parody. But it really hit a sensitive nerve in, in Charlestown. And the, the British and the Royal Gazette published this long, long article about how Frank was nothing but a pirate and he had no right to do this and he had no authority. And so they were pretty upset about that. What was interesting, though, is you know, uh, when Joe died and when Gabriel died, his two brothers, they made him the guardian of their, their children. So Job, Job's son, Theodore, Theodore Samuel, and Gabriel's son, Robert, the general grabbed those two boys just before the Bridges campaign, and they sent them up to Pennsylvania. So they spent most of the, the, the war at the University of Pennsylvania. And when they came home from Pennsylvania in 84, they said, and it was a big surprise to all of us, they said that every week there was an article in the newspaper up there about Frank and what he was doing, what the general was doing, all his great victories. So all these folks all over the colonies, to them, he was a big hero. And yet in, in South Carolina, people were hardly aware of what he was doing unless they were right there to see it. But the interesting thing was, even although all during the war, they, the British ignored him, they would not call him general, they would not call him colonel, it was Mr. Marion, they wouldn't give him a grander title. After the war, when they started publishing the reports that Rowden and those people were sending back to Parliament, it was General Marion this and General Marion that, you would have thought he was a grand marshal for the King of Prussia. 
all the importance they attached to his campaigns and what he was doing. And they blamed him for their failures. So it was really, a, it was quite enlightening. Although people around here just loved him because he took care of people. I can understand why the things in Charleston have ignored him. Um, I find that the British and, and the Charlestonians had very little sense of humor. <laughs> in fact, my understanding is that those Charles Williams were whining and dining with the officers because they had sent their sons to school in England and they had gone to school with people like Charlton and Rodden and Ben and Mike. I can understand that anybody in the back country, and we're in the back country, oh, uh, didn't amount to anything as far as those people in Charleston are. Well, you can't really use the broad brush. And that's true of some, some people. And yet, uh, Tom Strait, who was the son of the Ravens, came, was, was in school in London during the war. And after the state of South Carolina fell, he came home. He came back from school in London and he brought with him several barrels of gunpowder and flints, and he told the commander of the British forces that he was going to raise a loyalist regiment to fight for the king. And so they gave him four guns and powder, and he went out to the country, and he came right to, to the general, and he said, I want to fight for you. And he gave him the powder and the guns and, and everything else, and uh, so that he went on to fight with General Merrick. So there were a few. Charles Stone, yes. Oh, yes. And then there were a great number of people in the city who passed information to the general. He told everybody, he, he's a very practical man, and he knew, and he knows, and he can just read people better than anyone else I've ever, ever known. And he knows that a lot of people are weak. And so he would ask people to only do those things that he thought they could do. So, for example, in the country, he would say to people like myself, who was a single lady living alone, or an elderly couple, or a widow, take the British protection. But, send me food, and when you see a British patrol going by, take note of how many, the color of their uniforms, and all the information you can get from them, and let me know. And that's how he knew where everybody was and what they were doing, and that's how he was able to avoid capture, because so many people were on his side pretending to be on the British side. Uh, I forget who it was, it was one of the, oh, who was it? It was one of Peter Ory's friends down by Georgetown. Uh, they went into her, her plantation, and they knew they were friends, uh, and they asked the lady for, for supplies, which she normally would have given. But her cousins were visiting from the city, and they were Tories. So she called Peter aside, and she said, go back out, and then come, come back in and be very angry, and threaten to burn the house down if you don't get what you want. And I'll say, you can't have it, and then you'd be really nasty, and I'll say, okay, here are the keys. So they did. They played this little little charade for the ladies from Charlestown. Well, of course, Peter would never have heard his friend. But they came back to, oh, we're for the swamp box, and we're going to burn your house down if we don't you know, get the cider and the corn and beef or whatever it was they wanted. And, and she said, you can't have it. He said, well, we'll burn the house down. And said, well, here's the keys. Wink, wink. And they went out and they got their provisions and, and rode off. And of course, these Tory ladies went back to the city and complained to, to Colonel Belfour about how horrible the nasty swamp fox was because he was terrorizing this poor lady. Uh, but it, Frank didn't terrorize civilians. That wasn't, that wasn't his thing. Although there were a lot of people who would pretend to be with him, looted and did bad things. But if he caught them, he caught somebody pretending to be with him, 
before he caught his own people doing it. He was very severe. He was a strict disciplinarian, and he kept control at all times of his troops. Very important. That's good to hear. I, I heard so many things about him uh, you know, during the war because you don't know the truth. You really don't. And uh, as being related, even distantly, uh, I know he had to be a man of honor. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And so you're happily married here. Oh, yes. Very happy. We had our trouble, mind you. I was, I won't say how old I was, uh, but Frank was a uh, Oh, I think uh, Frank's five years older than I, and he was well over 50 uh, when we got married, and neither of us had been married before. So we had some problems. He's a very obstinate man, and I can be a little obstinate on myself. I've been told I have a bit of a temper, but uh, we worked things out. I remember... Uh, we had this, this, I like things neat. And the general is very clean about himself. But he's a man. He's got to come in, throw his hat here, throw his coat there. And so we had these little disputes about that. And he came in one day with mud on his boots, trying to cross my nice clean floor. And, uh, it was, well, this is my house, and of course you know women have no standing at all. So I asked Phoebe to go around with a little broom behind him to pick up the dirt. It was just one of those, those things that people get into that they never should get into. Well, wouldn't you know, Emmy Muzon came to visit, and there's Phoebe walking around with this dustpan behind the general. Well, I felt a little embarrassed. And, uh, so apparently the two of them were talking. The next time Henry came, I could hear him sitting on the, or I could hear him out on the porch, whistling, and he, he's not coming in, and he's not coming in, and I could hear him whistling and humming out there. And uh, finally I go out, and there he is with his, his, uh, his body servant, polishing his boots, polishing the top of his boots, polishing the bottom of his boots, polishing the heels of his boots, and I had to sit there and laugh. So the two of us laughed, and that was the end of that war. So the general and I came to the conclusion we take our shoes off when we come to the house. Well, the next time we had a little spat, a little spat, you know a husband can chastise. The general has never, ever, ever put a finger in you. But when I vex him, and I have to admit, I vex him at times. He'll, he'll go outside. Well, he was outside one day, walking around, muttering to himself, when I think it was Colonel James wrote up. I said, General, you're walking around out here without your hat on. It's too hot. You shouldn't be doing that. He said, it's a damn sight hotter inside. <laughs> I was so embarrassed. And when he came in, I was crying. And we sat down. And you know, the nice thing, the only nice thing about arguments is making up. Maybe that would be fun. But we, we entered into a treaty. See? I was going to be the queen of the house and the gardens, and he was the king of the rest of the world. <laughs> so with that division in mind, we had no more trouble. And uh, ever since then, we've got along very, very well. Unfortunately, as I say, he has a strange sense of humor. Uh, Henry came to visit one day. Henry had been married for years and years and years. He was an old married man. And uh, he was always younger than us. And he was kind of prodding to see how things were going. And the general says to him, Oh, they're going fine. If, uh, if there's any problems or I have any concerns, I simply throw my hat through the window. And if uh, Mary Esther is not feeling well, she bats it back out with her broom, and I know enough not to come into the house. I. When he came back in the house, I was, what do you mean saying that about me? And he was smiling. Oh, nobody will believe that. You know, you're, you're the mistress of a large house. You don't use a broom. You have other people do that for you. So they'll know that's just a joke. You 
you think so, but I will be I will be very mad. I'll come back and haunt you beyond the world that goes down in history that that's the way we live. That though we gave you the kiss, you know how it goes. But I, the, that just. I really need to make it. I've been years that I've admired him and, and wanted to know uh, more about him. And uh, do you suppose he'll be back this afternoon? Oh no. I think. Uh, I think that uh, I have no idea when they'll be back. <laughs> so you really should plan to spend the night. And Very fine. So uh, in the morning we'll be back. <coughs> so if you're all through, no questions for now. For now, I have some for the general tomorrow. Yes, please. But uh, he's been very, very kind. And I thank you very, very much. Well, we will enjoy talking in the morning. Let me show you to your room.